first, listen, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I know you have a lot of things to do. Uh, I can assure you our guests are busier than any of us, so you'll meet them in, in shortly. But just a little bit about uh, Wrestlers in Business is a group that originally started as a bunch of uh, wrestlers that got together and wanted to network. And our local chapter, we, along with wanting to promote wrestling, wants to promote uh, leadership skills. So uh, our speakers tonight will teach us a little bit about leadership and also obviously a little bit about wrestling since that's part of what we're about. Uh, for those that aren't wrestlers, I think you'll learn some new things tonight. But we also have some forms if you'll fill out, if you didn't, uh, just so we have some contact information that we appreciate. There's some in the back and there's some laying up front here, so if you don't mind doing that. And then, as most organizations, it would be nice if people are willing to do some donations, so we have some places for donations. And there's several organizations that are represented tonight that could use your support. USA Wrestling, which is uh, where our major guests are from, uh, and Wrestle Like a Girl is another organization along with wrestlers in business that would appreciate your support. So um, I think what I'm gonna do instead of introducing everybody is first introduce Terry Steiner and let you take the ball from there, Terry. So I'll let you introduce yourself first. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, I guess I, I just want to spend a few moments, and, and I just shared it with the group across the street. Uh, I want to share a few moments and, and talk about how I got involved with women's, the women's program at USA Wrestling and, and women's wrestling. Uh, I guess I want to preface that by just saying I'm a wrestling fan, okay? I'm a wrestling supporter. I believe in the sport of wrestling, and that's why I've chosen to uh, spend my life in the sport of wrestling to educate and, and move people forward through the sport. And, and so my, my, ch my story is um, I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota. Okay? Wrestling was important to me right away. I don't know why. Probably because I had a twin brother and he was pretty tough and I needed to keep up with him. Right? And, and so it was a, a way of survival. And, and so so wrestling was important in our lives. Um, uh, we, I, I went on, and my brother did as well. We went from the, Bismarck, North Dakota, and went on to the University of Iowa, and uh, had careers at the University of Iowa. We were both national champions there. And, and um, really, I think that the biggest blessing I have is I knew that I found my passion early in life. And I, I look at young kids right now, and, and if there's one thing that I would wish upon them, it would be to find their passion and find something that they can get excited about every day when they wake up and, and, and move forward. And, and wrestling was that for me. And so I went through my career at the University of Iowa. I competed internationally, trying to make a world and Olympic team, was unsuccessful at that. And, but I didn't want to leave the sport angry. I didn't want to leave the sport um, thinking that, that missing that accomplishment was the only thing. And, and the wrestling had been too good for, to me in so many other ways, in, in my personal development, my human development, even our family. Our family came together from the sport of wrestling unbelievably. Um, because it always pulled us back together, and not just our immediate family, but our extended family. As you know, like our senior year at the University of Iowa, um, at the NCAA Championships, my mom bought 90 tickets to the NCAA Championship, and that was really for extended family and friends that came and, and watched and supported. And that happened over and over and over throughout our career. And what, so what it did, pulling people together for a cause of just supporting two people in the sport of wrestling was unbelievable. And so, so anyway, so we fast forward and I knew that I wanted to spend my life in the sport of wrestling. I knew that after competing I wanted to be a coach. 
and I knew that early on. And my trajectory was always to be a Division I head coach. And, and so when I graduated from the University of Iowa in 1993, and the next year from 94, 95, 95, 96, I spent two years as an assistant coach at Oregon State University. And then I went to, to the University of Wisconsin as an assistant coach, and I was there for six years. And I was really getting antsy. By this time, I stopped competing uh, internationally in 2000 after I never made the Olympic team. And, and now I was full-fledged into coaching, and I wanted to, to be a Division I head coach. And I was getting antsy. And I, I told my wife, I'm going to call Rich Bender, our executive director at USA Wrestling, who is still in that position today. And I said, I want to just ask Rich for a letter of recommendation. Uh, for one of the college jobs that opened up uh, across the country. And, and so I called Rich and he said, yeah, I'll give you a letter of recommendation. He said, but what do you think about this job? And I said, what job? And he said, the women's national team coach. And I was like, Rich, you got the wrong guy. And, and I think I say that now and, and I say it uh, kind of embarrassed and ashamed because I, I was, wasn't opening my mind to it. Um, but. I, it was the time, I think, I was never exposed to it, to women's wrestling. I was never, I, I was never around it. And it was also the time when Title IX was a huge um, thing and we thought in the sport of wrestling it was causing us to lose wrestling programs because of the pro proportionality issue. And I think that was a wrong take on it, but we were blaming it on that, the, the sport of wrestling was. And so I was afraid that if I got into the sport that if I took this job and I took the women's national team coach that if I ever wanted to get back into college wrestling I would, wouldn't be allowed to. And so I went home and, and I talked to my wife. She said, did you call Rich? I said, yeah, I, call Rich. I called Rich, listen to what he said. And, and um, I said, he, uh, he, he said he'd give me a letter of recommendation but he, he asked me about this position and my wife being outside of the sport of wrestling and not being a, a college athlete or anything like that, she said, well, why wouldn't you look at it? And I said, did you hear what I said? And she, she was like, yeah, I heard what you said, but it's an opportunity in the sport of wrestling. And I kind of said, oh, I got to go. We'll talk to you later. And, and I, I left the house thinking, like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And, and I'm a twin, and, and my twin at the time was also as an assistant coach at the University of Wisconsin. He lived about a mile away from me. And I drove down to his place, and I talked to him about it. And I was just worried that, again, if I, if I take this avenue, am I going to be allowed to get back in? And I, didn't, I just didn't think I would be because of college coaches who wouldn't want to hire me. And, and he said, well, I don't know if you're looking at it the right way. He said, because if you come into the, back into college wrestling, you're going to be hired by college administrators and people that want to know you can work with everyone and, and can see things from every angle in every perspective and he said so I don't know if that's a really good reason and so I left his house like thinking the same thing like ah, he's no help either I was I was you know looking for a way out of this and I couldn't find it and and there, you know it was my wife and my twin brother the two people that I'm closest to and so now I really had to look at okay why am I in the sport of wrestling and and I and I think it's probably for, for those co you coaches out there, I think it's, it's probably the same. And I can speak for all of us. I mean, if you go ask 100 high school coaches why they coach, they're going to say that, you know, I, I believe in the sport of wrestling. You know, I believe in moving people forward. I believe in using the sport as a tool to reach people. And, and so my next question to myself is that if that's really why I'm going to do this, if that's really why I want to stay in the sport of wrestling, then why does it make a difference if it's a man or a woman in front of me? And, and really that's how I started thinking that this was a, a viable option that I, I really had to look at and I had to dig into deeper. And, and so I started down that road and I started talking to athletes and I started talking to coaches that were involved in women's wrestling and I started realizing that they had dreams just like I did. They had aspirations of becoming national champions and world champions and Olympic champions just like I did. And, and they needed someone to lead them. Now, I didn't know if I was that person, but I needed to look at it deeper. And, and so, you know, it, it was a few weeks went by, and, and um, 
my wife and I were driving one night and she said, I, I hate how you're thinking. And I just couldn't come around to it. I, I, and I told Rich, I said, if I can't come 100% behind it, I'm not going to do it. Because I know these girls need someone behind them. I just don't know if I'm that person. And if I can't support them 100%, I'm not going to do it. And, and we were driving home one night and my wife uh, said, you know, I really hate how you're thinking. She said, I was a young girl in the late 60s, early 70s. She said, I was, listening, I was sitting in a high school gymnasium in rural North Dakota, listening to people boo and ridicule and harass. She said, what do you think I was watching? I said, I don't know what you were watching. She said, I was watching a girls basketball game. And she said, this is the beginning of something. This is the start of a movement. It's be, it, it became an Olympic sport, and that's why USA Wrestling was looking for a coach, is because uh, in the fall of 2001, women's wrestling got added to the Olympic family. So in the spring of 2002, they're looking for a coach. And because 2004 was the first Olympic Games with women's wrestling in it. And so, you know, now, I'm, now my, you know, we're talking and my wife just said, you know, USA Wrestling is not just looking for a coach. They're looking for an advocate. They're looking for someone to stand up and fight the fight and fight the battles so these girls don't have to, so they can just do what they do. And, and right when she said that, I knew that, again, it, it pushed me a little bit further down the road. She just, <clears throat> because the one thing that our, my parents gave my brother and I w was opportunity. If we wanted to do something, they gave us the opportunity to do it. And, and, and then my wife said, and furthermore, you have a young daughter. And my daughter at the time was a year, a year old, year and a half. Now she's 18 years old, and she said, what if she wants to follow in your footsteps? Do you want her to have to go through what the Sally Roberts of the world were, were going through and, and fighting administrators and fighting coaches to be a part of teams and to be part of sport that they, that they fell in love with? You know, and, and a lot of these girls fell in love with the sport because they had fathers in it, they had brothers in it, and you're dragging them to the tournament every weekend, and and then they get excited about it, and then you tell them they can't do it, right? And so I knew right away that, that when my wife said that, that it was the right thing to do. And, and I called Rich the next day, and, and I told him that I'll take the position. But, and I thought I'd worked through everything, right? I thought I'd worked through, you know, all of my issues, and, and all of a sudden I'm in the room for the first time with the girls, and we're in camp, and all of a sudden, I don't know how to explain my own sport. I'm, I'm kind of awestruck, and I'm like, do I say chest, do I say breast, do I touch there, do I touch here? And I didn't know what I was doing, right? And, and I left the, that practice really ashamed because I realized that this wasn't their problem. This was my problem. This was my fear. They'd been wrestling guys from the beginning because that was their opportunity in the sport. If they were going to wrestle, they had training partners that were guys. They had, yeah, you know, coaches that were probably guys. I mean, women weren't involved in the sport. And, and so I just realized that, you know what, I need, just need to go back in there and be their coach. And I, I, as long as they know I have very black and white boundaries, they know that I'm here for a purpose, and that, they're, that I'm here to teach them that everything should be fine. And, and that's really how I've moved forward with it. Now, I've had struggles along the way, and there's been some differences in, in coaching women and different things I would do with coaching guys. But in general, I mean, coaching is coaching. Motivating is motivating, and, and teaching is teaching. And, and that's how I've really moved forward with it. And, and so, um, you know, I don't know how you feel about women's wrestling, but it's not going away. Right? We've been a part of the Olympic movement now. We're in, in our fifth Olympics coming up in Tokyo in 2020. And our numbers are growing for, uh, what is it, like, Sally, 27 consecutive years, I think. Our numbers are growing across the country for 27 consecutive years. I mean, those are huge things, right? You don't see that growth with other sports. And, and you know, we've went last year up until... Last year, we had six states that sanctioned the sport of women's wrestling. And last year, we went from six to 14 in one year. You know, when I started in 2002, we had five college wrestling programs. Now we're up over 50, right? I mean, it's not going away. And, and, 
and it's just keep continuing to grow. So, you know, I'm not saying that everyone has to be a women's wrestling coach, but to say that women don't belong on the wrestling mat okay, is not right. Women belong every place a man can be, right? And, and, and they deserve the opportunity. And, you know, we pride ourselves in the sport of wrestling that this sport is for everyone. This sport is, you know, for the person that's the tall and skinny kid and the heavier kid and the short kid and the kid, the, the black kid, the white kid, you know, I mean, it's a sport that is open for everyone, right? And, and it truly is. It's a sport for everyone, you know, regardless of gender as well. And so I, always, I, I just ask you to open your minds, open your hearts, open your thoughts on why women should be in the sport. And, and I just look at it like this, like, why would we want to eliminate half the population from the sport of wrestling? It can only enhance the sport. And I'm a wrestling fan, again. I'm the women's national team coach, but you take that jacket off, I'm a wrestler. I'm a wrestling coach. I, I believe in the sport of wrestling, men's and women's. And, and it can only enhance our sport, inviting the other half the population into it. <laughs> So, uh, I don't know if you have any questions for me. I'll take some questions and I'll pass it on. Any questions? Okay, I'd like to introduce Steve Frazier. Oh, right here. Did your she did not. So, and, and I, you know, again, I blame that on me more than anything. Um, probably, so, uh, he asked if my daughter wrestled. And, and, you know, being a national team coach, and my wife's a flight attendant, so my wife's gone half the month, right? And so my, when my wife was gone, my daughter was with me those, those days, right? 100% of the time. So if I was in the wrestling room when, when Sally was competing, my daughter was in the wrestling room every day with, with me. And, and one of our other athletes at, at the time, Christy Davis, Christy Morano, actually from, from New York, uh, and she's still to this day our most credentialed athlete. She, she went to the world championships nine, ten times and came home with nine medals, right? And, and so Christy was a huge part of our program and still is. Now she's a college coach in Georgia. Um, but, but Christy had a daughter, Kayla, who two years ago was on our cadet national team. Um, and Kayla was always around the room too, so so Raven, my daughter's name is Raven, and Raven and Kayla were always on the side of the room, you know, distracting me and, you know, and, and but, but, you know, gra you know, rolling around, grabbing each other, trying the things that we're trying out with the national team. They're over here doing on the side, and, and then Christy moved away. And, and what I didn't do is I didn't get her friends involved. And it was too intimidating for her to go into a boy's room. And shame on me. And then I spent the next six, eight years of my life in a volleyball gym, okay, <laughs> watching volleyball, right? And so, so I paid for that uh, later on, but, but anyways. Um, but she's learned from it, you know? I think the one thing as a coach, your biggest fear is, is that I'm spending all my time with someone else's kids. And, but she's definitely heard the messages. She's been around the elite athletes. They're like big sisters to her. They, she's been around, she's heard the messages, she saw the growth, and it's really shaped her life as much as it's shaped my life. And so even though she wasn't a wrestler, wrestling has influenced her greatly. So, okay. Yeah. You go back a few years in the conversation with yourself, give yourself one piece of advice when you started, what would it be? I would just say, don't worry about everyone else so much. You know, just do what you need to do. And, and I, I brought this up to the group earlier. You know, when I, when I left the University of Iowa and I started coaching at Oregon State, Coach Gable at the time, uh, Coach Gable was really wondering why I was leaving. And I just told him that I feel that there's an institution and a program out there that I can help. And I want to go see what I can do, you know. and, and and I want to start to 
develop my coaching career as well. And you know, so he he said, well, if you're leaving for those reasons, then it's the right thing to do. But he said, don't don't ever think it's going to be hard to coach against the Hawkeyes. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, because coaching is all about relationships, and that's all that matters are the people in front of you, the people you're influencing every day. That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. And I think when I first got into women's wrestling, I was so worried about what my peers were thinking, you know, because I always had one foot in the door, I, I think the first couple of years, and one foot out looking to where the next college job was opening up. I always thought I'd be back in college wrestling, Division I wrestling. And then this just took on a life that I couldn't let go of. I, it was just... There was, there was more purpose here than I felt I was needed here more than I was needed back in college, college athletics, and that's why I'm still here today. So, <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Steve Frazier. Uh, Steve Frazier, as many of you may know, he's the first Olympic champion in Greco-Roman wrestling for the United States back in 1984. Okay. Um, after, after that, he was hired uh, in, the, in the 90s, he was hired by USA Wrestling to run the Greco-Roman program at a time when they thought it was crazy, like we can never win in the sport of Greco-Roman wrestling. And he led that program for 19 years and to this day is the, still the only coach that won the world championship with the Greco-Roman wrestling team. Okay, and, and so uh, st a couple years ago, Steve stepped away from coaching and now is uh, director of, I don't know, development and alumni relations with, with USA Wrestling and, and really is a huge part of, you know, it takes money to do what we do, right? And, and so he's a huge part of helping bring those funds into the organization for our national teams and, and our programs to go. So. All right. Steve Frazier. Thank you. Does this screw you up if I'm down here with the camera? Is it okay here? I'll brighten it up. You'll bright Should I be back for the light? No, it's okay. I like to be close to who I'm speaking with. How many wrestling people we have in here? So most of you wrestle. Wonderful, wonderful. How many don't wrestle but are in another sport. Anybody? Okay. Okay, cool. So what I want to do just briefly is I'm going to share with you uh, just a, one experience that I had as a wrestler that if you're a wrestler, I hope it will help you and inspire you. But if you're not, even if you're not an athlete, I hope you can draw from this because it's, it's really one of the, in my mind, one of the most important things to be successful in whatever you do. Before I go into this story, I want to also say Terry Steiner, I know Terry Richbender is so proud of you. He's been the greatest thing for our women's wrestling program. Uh, 17 years he's been the national coach, NCAA champion, most valuable player, or most valuable uh, athlete at the, for, at the NCAA the year he won it for the University of Iowa. And so everyone's really proud of what he's done in the sport of women's wrestling, for sure. And you're going to hear from our two world medalists here very shortly, too, right after I'm through. So I won't keep you, but I wanted to, I wanted to just say this. When I first started wrestling in the eighth grade, I was terrible. I was the worst wrestler on the team. I didn't win a match. But through good coaching and through working hard and through listening to my coaches and listening to my parents, I finally became good enough to win the state championship in the state of Michigan. Now you should have saw me, I, was, won, a, I won a state championship title, full scholarship to go to the best university in the entire country, University of Michigan, right? <laughs> Right? I know Iowa, he's from Iowa, but even Terry knows that. <laughs> so I go to the University of Michigan as a freshman. I mean, you should have saw me. I'm like strutting my stuff. Yeah, 
State champ, full ride. I'm gonna make the varsity team no problem. The guy I had to beat to make the team, his name was Mark Johnson. Actually, Mark was the assistant coach at Iowa years later and, and helped coach Terry. Mark Johnson was a senior captain of the team. And let me tell you, Mark Johnson had a little different idea what was gonna happen when he and I wrestled, different from my idea. I'm not kidding you, Mark Johnson and I wrestled almost every single day for the first four months of my freshman year. Never once, not one single time, did I score a single point on the sky. I mean, he beat the living tar out of me every single day. You'd figure after about, I don't know, two months of beating me up, come on, might feel sorry for me. Let me score one escape or something. No way. In the classroom, I was failing two classes. I was failing a history class and a physiology class. Going down for the third count, big fat Fs on all my tests. There's no way I thought I could pass these classes. I know my professors were Xing me off their roster saying that he going home, he ain't gonna make it. I remember calling my mom on the phone, tears in my eyes, the whole nine yards, telling him, Mom, I'm coming home, I'm failing these two classes, and Mark Johnson keeps kicking my butt in the wrestling room. I was as low as I could be. But let me tell you, what I learned from scratching and clawing and fighting and getting through those setbacks, those hardships, is with me today, still, at 55 years old. Okay, 60. <clears throat> 61 in a month. <clears throat> but they're still with me today, and I know they will be with me the rest of my life. Now, what I learned is, yeah, Steve Frazier, he can do anything he wants if he really wants it bad enough. Now, what I had to do in that classroom, in those classrooms, I should say, it was more than one class, is I had to get with a tutor. And this tutor basically taught me what to study, how to study, when to study. There's where I was really falling down. My study habits weren't very good coming out of high school. I am not kidding you. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe it then. I still kind of can't believe it to this day. I went from com complete failure in these two classes, Fs on all my tests, to A's on the final exams. I was like in shock, completely in shock, that I could make that dramatic of a comeback <clears throat> in the sport, in, in the, in the, actually in the academic side of my life. In the wrestling room, I will never forget this. I finally took Mark Johnson down. I finally scored on him. It was a Friday, December 15th, 3.36 in the afternoon. <laughs> I remember I hit arm drag, boom. I, I hit him arm drag, I took him down. Two point take, I remember jumping up. Yeah, I was so excited. Until I just looked back on the mat, saw there was a big puddle of water on the mat, and he had just slipped in that puddle. <laughs> and he proceeded to kick my butt for another two months after that. But my point is, I am 100% confident, without a doubt, that if I would not have endured and overcome those struggles, I know for a fact I would never have won an Olympic gold medal. Positive. So I encourage you, oh, and by the way, I don't know if people are, have seen an Olympic gold medal. Have you? Who's seen one? Who's touched one? Okay, I'm gonna pass it. I want you to pass it around. Rub it, it's good luck. Make sure you give it a good rub. I'll be watching where it's traveling, so. <laughs> but um, 
I guess the main message I want to leave you with is, especially the young ones in here, that you have got to, or we have got to, be willing to meet our struggles head on and overcome those struggles or get through those struggles if we really want to succeed in whatever we're trying to do. And I promise you, you're going to meet a lot of struggles in your life. I mean, you'd figure after 61 years next month that you get to a point where you're like, man, I'm there. No more struggles. Now, still got to overcome stuff today. So, I'll leave you with that. Um, and the highlight here, Terry, you want me to, I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce, why don't you guys both come up and Sarah Hildebrand. Okay, okay. Do you have any questions for me be, before I call up the true stars of today? Yes. At what point did you uh, get into Greco? I got into Greco-Roman wrestling when I was in the 10th grade. My coach, Masaki Hata, many people in the wrestling world know Tadaki Hata. He's been very involved with the women's wrestling program, actually. He's from Ohio. It's his brother. Uh, Masaki uh, took me under his wing. He was a, a world silver medalist from Japan. He wrestled at Oklahoma State, won the NCAA for Oklahoma State. Um, he took me under his wing and took me to my first Greco tournament when I was in the 10th grade. And he believed in gre wrestling Greco, freestyle, both styles. Now, you know, do you, let me ask the, the, the people in here that are wrestlers, do you know what freestyle is? Okay, so you know there's folk style that you, a lot of, the boys wrestle in high school and a lot of the girls. Then the two Olympic styles are freestyle and Greco. And so he took me to my first Greco tournament and I don't know, I just fell in love with it from day one. So I wrestled both styles my whole career. In fact, the year I won, and I'm not bragging, but the year I won the Olympics in Greco, I actually won the US Open in freestyle. And I was second in the US Open in Greco. So I wrestled both styles, they're all great. Anything else? Okay. So Sarah Hildebrand and Mallory, Mallory Felt, they're our two latest world medalists. Sarah was silver medal in Budapest World Championships in October, and uh, Mallory was bronze, and they are tremendous. I'm gonna pass it, and you guys can, they're gonna share with you a little bit of whatever kind of story they wanna share. <laughs> We're gonna use the stools because wrestling has made our bodies hurt. No. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, I'm Sarah. Um, I. What do I want to talk about? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things I could talk about um, because of wrestling, right? There's stories of heartbreak and stories that are funny and <laughs> maybe probably awkward, but um, I feel like something that's important um, that wrestling has given me uh, that will transcend to everything in life um, is really my confidence and how empowered I am to tackle whatever is in front of me. Um, and you know, that's just also from being uh, originally starting in a sport that was dominated by men um, and just having the courage uh, which I don't even know to this day where I mustered that courage <laughs> to begin uh, wrestling. I think just my true love for the sport um, brought me there. But little fun fact, when I was growing up, I moved around a lot. Um, I was and still am very bookish, uh, <laughs> kind of the weird kid at school. Um, very quiet. I didn't talk to anybody at school. I didn't really talk at home. Um, and confidence was not something that you would consider me to have ever been. Um, it just never was. Somehow I decided I wanted to wrestle on the men's team though. And even through those years um, and, and through high school I was very quiet. Um, 
And then but you could just see all these years leading up and going and wrestling and um, making friends and, and learning and facing um, challenges. Uh, confidence was just beginning to take place and, and grow inside of me. And, um, and now you could ask Terry that I don't shut my mouth, um, <laughs> you know. I, um, but, you know, besides just being confident enough to now speak in front of a group of people, um, I'm confident to wrestle on the world stage. I'm confident to tackle uh, dreams that I have. I want to bake bread when I'm done wrestling. That's something I'll tackle full on and believe I can do. I want to write books. Um, and these are all things that I don't think I ever would have had the courage or thought myself the ability to do had it not been um, for wrestling and all of that. It's taught me from that. So really there's millions and millions of stories I could sit here and tell you, but um, just the story of a little girl who was too afraid to talk to her parents <laughs> to grow up into a woman who uh, fierce, fiercely chases her dreams, um, I can attribute that all to wrestling. So. I think really that's my biggest takeaway. Oh, you go. Maybe a little applause for Sarah. <laughs> Thanks. Good, good talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, hi, I'm Mallory. I won a bronze medal um, in Budapest this last year in wrestling. Um, I'm 24. Uh, this was my second time wrestling. The first time I went one and out, so it was a, quite an improvement on, on the world stage. But uh, yeah, similar to Sarah, there's lots of stories that we could tell. Um, I grew up in California where wrestling is a bit bigger, but still definitely uh, not where it needs to be now. Um, but I think the biggest thing that's made an impact for me in the sport of wrestling is having female role models. Um, going into wrestling, there was one other woman on the team. She was uh, a junior, I was a freshman. Somebody who I looked up to tremendously who beat me up, similar to how Steve was saying, and uh, having, I think, an older person that I could look up to, see them do it, and then myself, put myself in their shoes and do it too, is uh, something really important for me. Then I went on to university where there was a women's team, um, and really just getting beat up and uh, learning lessons from older, mature athletes, you know, an 18-year-old going into college, never been, being on a girls team before, and then having um, 20 other women who were smarter than me, better at wrestling than me, could, could beat me up on a daily basis was um, super refreshing. And um, one of my role models, Danielle Lepage, I went to university in Canada, so she was a Canadian. She um, beat me up on a daily basis. So I don't know if any of the girls here, it's not super common that you'll have a female training partner who can just kill you and you don't really improve on them. But that was the situation. I really didn't improve um, for the first year or so I wrestled with her. Um, but then she went on to go to grad school while I was still in my early university and I saw, hey, there's another female athlete who's putting 100% into wrestling but also putting herself into academics, putting herself into TA and courses and then later go putting herself through the Olympics, law school, um, all these amazing things that I never would have seen had not been joining wrestling. So. That was very inspirational and um, really helped me in my own career, saying that, you know, I can do this as well. Seeing somebody else do it um, was very lucky, and I don't think that's something that girls have very often, is uh, female role models that have good values, that uh, work hard, you know, that um, pursue their dreams. So that's something special that wrestling has given me, and I hope that that's something that uh, you advocates and wrestlers have uh, in your own rooms, in your teams and amongst your friends. So yeah, um, do you want to open up for? Yeah, I also just want to add that I think, um, you know, wrestling is our passion and, and we kind of were talking about this earlier, just um, it is something we love and, um, and that was able to inspire and encourage us through things. But I know there's girls here who are not wrestlers and, and maybe they want to become wrestlers or whatever it is they're doing. I think the real core of the message though is having that passion and being inspired by it, uh, whether it be wrestling, whether it be baking. Um, and so I think, you know, whatever it is you're doing, um, I think really that's kind of, ours is wrestling and that's what it's given to us. And I think there's lots of avenues in life that can give you these same things and, and to be inspired by these things and to give it your all and, and find role models and find girls and women to look up to. and. Um, 
there are a whole bunch of them. So, you know, I just wanted to get that out there too. But yeah, if there's any questions, unless you have more to add. Sure. What was your toughest curve? Yeah, um, I guess originally my toughest hurdle, you know, it's funny when I think, or when people ask me that question, I think the natural response is to be, well, people didn't believe in me. But when I really think back to uh, growing up in wrestling, it was more believing in myself. And, and that was the battle. It was much more internal than it was that I cared if anybody else believed in me. Um, it was more so, did I have it in myself? And I think that's what, and it catapulted me on is every day waking up and being like proving to my own self that I am capable of achieving what I want to and and that and this self was a hurdle you know to know I could do this um, and, and do it um, and then now later on in my career I'd say there's catapults of just injuries <laughs> staying healthy um, being an intelligent athlete outside of just uh, you know wrestling hard, you know, how can I be an intelligent athlete recovering and, and staying healthy? And these days I would say it's injury. Uh, yeah, so a big hurdle for me was, well, while Steve said he wasn't good at wrestling in eighth grade, I didn't have the opportunity to wrestle in eighth grade. I asked to um, join the team and I was turned away by the coach. My, my, they talked my mom out of it. They told me it wasn't for girls. All those things that we hear a lot, um, maybe less so now, but more so back in the day um, when you weren't seeing girls at tournaments as much and you weren't seeing them in the room. So then uh, in high school, seeing that there was one other girl on the team and that girls can wrestle, that was, um, that was something that was kind of like conflicting, right? Because you're like, girls can't wrestle, wait, girls can wrestle. And then given, given that opportunity, that was like, I, get, I would say a hurdle, but also just um, inspiring, right? And then later on in my career, yeah, injury in my <laughs> first year at a, in college, I tore my ACL and I had to take a year off. So on top of getting beat up all year long um, and being at the bottom of the barrel, I was then out for a year. But that uh, setback also propelled me to do very well the next year. I was um, hungrier and came back much stronger. So yeah. Any other questions? Hmm. <laughs> Can you repeat it, please? Oh, what is our favorite takedown? Um, I would say mine. You know, I like being in the front headlock, but I like single legs. Low sweep singles, definitely my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I'm 100% a double leg. That's my favorite takedown. I experienced it today. It is <laughs> very good. <laughs> Yeah, so I have two brothers, um, and they wrestle, um, and so yeah, I was just like, okay, I was getting drugged to the tournaments. Initially, I was like, gosh, this is horrible. Why am I here? <laughs> but you know, as I started to watch, um, I really became obsessed so quickly, um, keeping stats, and then then I wanted to learn the takedowns, and then I was like, I'm gonna start a girls' team, and I'm gonna wrestle, and. Uh, so yeah, really my brothers initially started that, that love interest. <laughs> yeah, and for me it was more like my dislike of basketball, and that, <laughs> those are the two sports I had the opportunity to play in the wintertime, so I really didn't want to play basketball, and I was always kind of like a, you know, full contact soccer player, so I was looking forward to trying out wrestling once I was given the opportunity. Yeah. Like, I want to oh, yeah. my favorite takedown. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any more questions for Sarah and Mallory? Uh, oh, okay. So, my training schedule, um, I'm on the mat one to two times a day, um, pretty much every day. And then there's some um, lifting in there three times a week, three or four times a week. Um, and then I love to run uh, despite 
my sports med suggestion. No. <laughs> um, I love to do running, so I'll get some sort of conditioning workout in every single day, as well as a core circuit. And um, I love yoga. I do yoga now probably four times a week, um, in the morning, at night, whenever I can squeeze in another workout. <laughs> and then, um, does anybody know what the Manitou Incline is? It's this giant set of stairs up a mountain, and it's just as horrible as you're imagining. But for some reason, I love to do that, and so I do usually do that uh, once a week. So um, my training is pretty packed schedule, um, and, and I think that's pretty much the schedule we'll keep leading into Worlds. We also travel a ton to different countries all over the world to um, get different training in versus different um, countries as well. So that kind of changes the normal schedule, but that's my favorite routine that I usually stick to. Yeah, and my routine is similar, two times a day usually. Um, a cardio and a mat practice or a lift and a mat practice um, is usually how it goes. And then Saturday just one, Sunday's off. That's Sunday's yoga. <laughs> that's what we're gonna start doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Mal's a master lifter as well. She's like weight training down. So. Yes, nutrition is a newfound love of mine. Um, recently, they've changed the way and procedures for wrestling. And I think some of us think of wrestling and we think of those crazy kids who sleep in trash bags and spit their weight out. Um, and that was unsettling to me. I started to dislike a sport that I once loved because it be, was so central, to, centered around, you know, don't eat that and you don't get to drink water tonight and you should go sit in the sauna for 30 minutes. And it was just so unhealthy and, and I, I didn't have time to think about wrestling because I was thinking about, you know, how much I weighed. Um, so about a little over a year ago, I decided to I didn't want to cut weight anymore, which is funny because then I ended up dropping a weight class um, and really taking nutrition into effect. So um, I eat pretty healthy year round. It's not this binge eating. Um, with that said, I love cookies and I love ice cream and I eat healthy enough that I can enjoy a cookie uh, often. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think with the long game of wrestling, as we're gearing up towards 2020, it's um, pretty impossible to, you know, diet down and then binge back and then diet down and binge back. It's not very um, good for our bodies and it's not good for our psychological <laughs> health. So, uh, yeah, I, similar to Sarah, I really tried to keep my weight um, at a happy place where I never have to go hungry or, uh, and I never have to like refuse myself of something that I want, but that just means eating in moderation, eating lots of vegetables, um, maybe not eating out very often, things like that. So I think uh, that's one of the benefits of wrestling is that it really supports a healthy lifestyle, right? Sleeping, eating, and. Yeah, it's a very conscious effort to, I guess that's really what my change was. I just started consciously noticing everything I'm putting in my body. And at first it was kind of hard, you know? I'm like, oh, I have to, you know, maybe eat this, not that. Now it's just so natural and I, I love looking for ways to eat healthy. It's almost, it's really enjoyable. I think if any wrestlers are thinking about starting to think about what they want to eat, the easiest way to do that is just to start writing down what you're eating during the day, not changing anything, but just making, making it conscious, right? Yeah, making cautious. And I really think um, there is a lot of room for change in our sport when it comes to cutting weight and how um, wrestlers, coaches, how we're viewing it as a sport right now, and, and it just needs to change. And so I think, you know, it starts with athletes. We, we don't need to be making these drastic weight cuts to make a certain weight. You can be successful. I weigh 116 pounds and I wrestle, or I weigh 117 pounds, I wrestle 116 pounds and I'm successful. You don't need to be um, cutting 10 pounds to be the best in the world. So I think that's a great question. Nutrition is a huge part of it. Being an elite athlete and, uh, and in wrestling as well. Okay, I'd also like to introduce uh, one other person, Sally Roberts. Sally is a, a two-time world bronze medalist for Team USA, and she is also the, the founder of a women's advocacy group, uh, wrestling advocacy, uh, Wrestle Like a Girl. And I'd like, Sally, I'd like to invite you up and say a few words. Okay.
Thank you. My name is Sally Roberts. I started wrestling. Um, some of you earlier at dinner tonight already heard this, but growing up, my mother had been married multiple times. I didn't like being at home. I would go out after school and shoplift. I would break into houses. I got into so many fights that I got arrested. I actually got arrested so many times that I got put in front of a juvenile detention officer, and the juvenile detention officer told me that I had a choice. I either had to find an after-school activity or I was going to face going to juvenile detention. I grew up in Seattle, and I couldn't have told you what Harvard, Stanford, or <coughs> Yale was, but I knew what juvenile detention was because all of my peer group was affected by it in some way. So I decided that I was going to take my life into my own hands and look for an opportunity so that I would stay out of trouble. And I tried out for all the girls' sports, softball, basketball, volleyball, but I got cut from every single one of those because I didn't know how to play well with others. And what that translated into was that I was not athletic in their eyes. But here I was, an athlete that was begging for inclusion into something, giving me a place to belong so that I had a I could do something with my life other than the alternative, which was juvenile detention. I saw that the list of activities, um, wrestling was a no-cut sport. That meant as long as I went out and wrestled and I didn't quit, that meant that I was not going to be going to jail. That one single decision forever changed the trajectory of my life. And when I started wrestling in the state of Washington, like some of you when you started wrestling here in New York, there was, a, there was an idea where people thought that I had actually brought women's wrestling to the forefront. But it wasn't me. The person that actually brought women's wrestling to the forefront was my coach. The coach that allowed me into the room, he had no idea of my background. He just knew that sometimes there's athletes that come to the sport of wrestling because they're running from something or they're running to something. And every sport, every athlete deserves to get captured. Every athlete, each and every one of you that are sitting here in this room, you all belong in that wrestling room. It doesn't matter how much you weigh. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter what your family is like at home. Everyone belongs in that space. We've seen time and time again what happens when girls get the opportunity to shine, whether it's in the sport of wrestling, or it's in music, or it's in something that they love, that they find their passion with. And that is what I love to see. One of my favorite things is to go into my social media feed because I live female advocacy to my bones. I can go onto my social media feed and I can see what's happening in the state of New York, that there's rule changes. I can see how many girls in the state of New York are wrestling now and how many are getting hydrated. And I can tell you that the numbers are growing and that there's a place for each and every one of you. And for all of you that are considering wrestling but you're not sure if you want to do it, bring a friend because it's so much more fun when there's someone else that you know is going to meet you there. You're going to build a sisterhood like you never have had a capacity for. These two athletes, we used to train together, and now they're my friends outside of the sport. Terry Steiner, he was one of the most influential people that I ever had the honor of being coached by. In 2002, I was wrestling at Pacific University in Oregon. I actually had a 1.09 GPA because I really didn't want to go to school. I really wanted to wrestle. So I went up to Terry and I said, listen, you don't know me, but if you let me come to your program at the Olympic Training Center, I promise you, I'm going to make you proud. I don't know what he saw in that moment, but I went back and actually looked at a picture of me in 2002, and I wasn't fit, I wasn't healthy, and I really needed something else to go to. Again, Terry let me into the wrestling room. Another male advocate who opened the door so that I could be included, and in one year, I was a, world bronze, a national champion and a world bronze medalist. But even more so, Terry was the one to reinforce that I was smart and that I could go to college. And though it took me 10 years to get my undergrad, which is a running joke in my family because my mom says most people after 10 years are doctors, that didn't matter because what Sarah said earlier is we were traveling all over the world. I had the most fun traveling all over the world, going to class, wrestling in international competitions, and figuring out who I was, who I was in my own space. I found my, I, I realized within the sport of wrestling I could own my own space, I could own my own voice, and I knew that the future was mine to behold. 
So all of you girls that are out here that want to wrestle, we want you. And I know I was sitting next to two softball players. Listen, wrestling wants you too. It's never too late. <laughs> and to all of the men in this room, thank you so much for being advocates. And to all of the women in this room, thank you so much for being willing to watch your daughters sometimes go to practice and just get hammered on by some guys. And they come home and you say, you know what, baby, I'm so proud of you. Because we've all been wrestling and we know that our parents sometimes haven't heard the nicest things but you know what happened every time we came off the mat our parents gave us a hug and they said keep it up and you're gonna you're gonna shine and what they didn't know is that there was gonna be three women and a coach on this stage someday that was gonna make everyone proud not because we were women in male dominated sport but because we are now leaders and we are here to give back to our community and to support and to foster growth and to build everything because one thing that we know is not men's wrestling or women's wrestling, it's wrestling and we all have a place. Does anyone have questions for Sally? <laughs> She's very good at that. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, question, yes. What, at what point do women, since you guys are at this world level, which is so amazing, because since I have girls coming up and they're gonna go to college, at what point do you make this decision, am I gonna have a career in wrestling as coaching um, or branch off into other types of careers? Or when do you focus on your careers? Do you have time to focus on your careers moving okay. forward? I think it will be fun for each of us to answer in our own way. F from my perspective, the time to branch out into your career beyond wrestling is when you show up in the wrestling room and there's a passion that drives you beyond anything else. For the first 16 years that I was wrestling and I was at the Olympic Training Center, I, was n I never missed practice once. I showed up every day, I was early. When I had the idea that I wanted to run an organization, wrestle like a girl, suddenly I was in practice and I wasn't thinking about becoming a, a world champion or an Olympic champion. I was thinking about how am I gonna have an impact? And that's when I knew that my heart had moved on and I had to allow myself the space and the grace to acknowledge that. Because to do something in life where your heart isn't in it and you're not fully engaged with passion, then you're not setting yourself on fire. And we've all heard that the one thing that the world needs is each and every person to come alive. And where do you come alive? For some of us in the wrestling room and for some of us it's in the youth sport development advocacy and for some of us it's in business. And we can all have an impact and it's not a zero sum game. That means for me to win, she doesn't have to lose. We can all rise together and when we follow our heart and we follow our passion, you can never go wrong. Yeah, that sums it up pretty nicely. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. For me, uh, I always have to have a few things going. I get a little bored with just doing one thing. So when I, I knew when I finished um, my degree and I wasn't going to class any longer that there, I needed something else going on. So I uh, decided to start coaching a youth team, assistant coaching that, as well as assistant coaching a college team while I'm training because uh, I really enjoy uh, coaching kids, coaching adults, and I enjoy uh, wrestling still. So it's something that I have to have a few things because when wrestling bogs you down, it's nice to have a little escape somewhere else. So that works for me. But Yeah, no doubt. I definitely um, you know, keep busy with little things. Um, but I, I would say I'm a lot like, like Sally was saying, I definitely, it's very, and I know Mallory's like this too, you know, it's just entirely consuming, um, my goal right now. It's very clear. I know what I want to do there. You couldn't tempt me with any other goal, with any other money. Um, you know, so, um, is there going to come a day where that's not the case? Probably so. Um, at this sport and to trace a dream like that with not 100% passion behind it, uh, it just isn't worth it to me. So um, when there's not 100% for that goal, I all know that I want to put 100% into something else and I'm excited for the opportunity, but definitely right now it is a very clear vision.
Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, for me personally, it's uh, a lot of support, um, specifically just for me as <laughs> who Sarah Hildebrand is. Um, so I guess my brand, you would call it financially, it's a, a lot of support. Um, chasing this dream uh, can be very difficult uh, financially, and so uh, they really support me in that nature as well. But really one of my biggest things with Rudis was the growth of women and, and taking that step um, you know, them sign, I'm the first woman they have signed and, and we're obviously looking to sign more women and, and, and that inclusion into these sponsorships that have never before been offered to women. Um, and that was kind of our, our foundation and our, why we were meeting and, and where are we going with this. So um, with that being such a big goal personally, um, that is something that Rudis is definitely giving me and we're really excited to, to grow women's wrestling and um, to support women's wrestlers because uh, this is a, a dream and you need money that's sometimes not always available and, and, and they're willing to help and, and to grow, so, so thank you. <laughs> Go get your Rudis stuff, everyone. <laughs> Shameless advertising. <laughs> Any more questions? The who? Yes. Oh, such a good question. I played so many sports. Oh, the question was, when did I realize wrestling was my sport? Um, gosh, well, I was playing tennis, swimming, wrestling, and soccer at the same time. And at all those other practices, I just wanted to be at wrestling. <laughs> so it was... Uh, uh, and you know that speaks a lot because I wasn't the best wrestler. I was much better at soccer. I was horrible at swimming, so that was a giveaway. But <laughs> uh, you know, I was better at other sports. But I would find myself at soccer practice wishing I was at wrestling practice, or I would find ways to have extra wrestling practice so I could just do wrestling more. So it was very clear um, when I realized that my passion was all there. Um, so I started wrestling in high school, and then it's a winter sport, right? So then after that, it's like, well, let's choose a spring sport. So I went to swimming as well. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't like this. I want to go back to wrestling. So then I started wrestling in the freestyle off season, and that's when I realized this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it all the way. I think for some people, they find wrestling. But for me, wrestling found me. And because it had saved me from going down a particularly dark road, I had a loyalty to that. And what I wanna ask each and every one of you is, how can you get involved more in wrestling, knowing it has so many good, powerful, positive benefits? Maybe you're a softball player and you guys are gonna go out and try a practice. Or maybe you're a parent and you can go talk to your athletic director. Or maybe you're an influencer within the community and you can go talk to a section chief. Or maybe you're good at advertising and you're going to help us communicate that girls across the state want this opportunity. Because sometimes we think it's the interest that needs to create the opportunity. But what I found from my own life, it's the opportunity that creates interest. So I'm going to ask each and every one of you in this audience to continue to support the growth and the equality in wrestling by using your voice, by using your heart, by using your talent and joining everyone in this room to grow the sport. Any more questions? <laughs> awesome. So thank you for everybody for coming and you can't have a better ending than that, so. There's nothing else to say after those comments. So thank you, appreciate your time coming, and let's support women's wrestling. <laughs> feel, feel free to mingle and talk with these guys if you want to, because they're not tired. <laughs>